All right, well, we're all in for a treat here today. We've got John Burbank, who is um, one of the finest investment minds out there, as, as uh, was mentioned, um, predicted the housing crisis, and now is very deep uh, into crypto and blockchain. Um, so what my job is to try to get some of those views out of John today, uh, see where we are today, what's the state of the market, and uh, where we're going. Um, so let's, let's start, John, with I've heard you call investing in general a fuzzy Polaroid. Uh, we don't have all the information. We can kind of see the picture. Where are we today in crypto and blockchain? What does that fuzzy Polaroid look like? And what's it going to look like in five years? Okay. So uh, I try to figure out, just to back up, I try to figure out what's going to be the extraordinary things five years from now which you'll look back on and say, oh my gosh, I wish I was spending, I had spent my time looking at thinking about that. And what, what does it make, what makes sense structurally that, that will happen, that it's never happened before. So I like to say that I, I like to invest in things that have never happened before. That's where the signal is, that's where the returns are. And it's really telling you a lot about the world as it's, as it's becoming, as opposed to a mean reversion, looking backwards, expecting the, the past to repeat itself, okay? So, I'd say when I the answer to that question, what I'm really looking at is how new platforms, new platforms of technology are changing the biggest sectors um, in the economy and the world. So I've done a lot of startup investing the last seven, eight years. I've invested in almost 100 companies. I've invested in over 20 venture funds. I have a pretty good perspective about what's going on uh, in the ground. I like this because I get to see views of startups about how different the future is going to be. So this is just, I like the frontier. This is how I like to try to think about the world. So what I, what I, what's happening in crypto is not that different than what's happening in genomics, where you have a partially consumer funded development of technology as through, say, if you're a 23andMe uh, user, you've partially funded uh, genomics uh, sequencing. There's only 20 million genomes that have been sequence so far. It's an incredibly small amount. And yet, if you spend any time there, you'll realize, because the cost has crashed so much, you can sequence one genome for 30, 40 bucks now, um, you'll realize that we're right on the doorstep of massive applications because it's, it's, it's possible. And if you look at, um, but this is a regulated, you know, very, very highly regulated thing if you're going to actually be, be implemented at your, your doctor in a hospital or whatever, or health plan. And if you look at autonomous driving you know, with autos, you're realizing something that was cra sounded crazy is really you know, on the doorstep of application. But there's a lot of technology and regulation that had to change to allow this, and it still hasn't quite happened yet, but it's going to. Um, I could go through, you know, autos are 6% of the economy, finance is 20, right. healthcare is 20, uh, education is 6% of the economy, and I've spent a lot of time on ed tech. Um, it's, it's, there were, Fewer than 100 ed tech companies 10 years ago, and now there's like th over 3,000. Like the changes there is, are gonna be really substantial, but that also is a partially, you know, it's a regulated thing. So when I look at the thing about crypto, I'm just looking at this as, as a, a you know, pattern recognition to say, it, we need different platforms to enable much more efficiency, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, to enable the inclusion of much more information that you know is held out of of, of, uh, of markets, so when I look at it this way, I think this is inevitable. It's just a question, you know, it's got its own characteristics, its own funding, um, you know. But this is the era where the era we're in, the next five years, I think, is about how technology is entering and will scale much faster than you believe in the biggest sectors of the economy, because the biggest sectors haven't changed that much when you really think about each one, right. you know, based on technology. Yeah, I mean, so I, I, the point you bring up about 20% of the economy is financial. And now we're talking about a technology that is disruptive to that industry. Um, it seems to me, and if you look back uh, at, the, at the, the turn of the last century, when you had a change from an agrarian economy to an industrial economy, uh, you had a very similar thing where 20% of the economy was farming and, uh, and agriculture, and it switched to this industrial. And that created quite a bit of upheaval. Is that the type of thing we're looking at in financial services at this point? Well, when I think about what will the finance area look like 10, 15 years, I don't know how long, it's basically going to be a, called fintech. 
I think. <laughs> yeah. It's just going to end up, it's all going to be what we think of as fintech. I mean, these, most of finance is constrained by the platforms that they work on. And so what, I'm, what I believe is that you, when you, you need to finance, think up, finance, introduce these new platforms, and then you can shift to, to, to that. So it's okay. you know, simple, simple one is just market making, you know, floor market making to electronic trading. Right. That's, that's clearly um, you know, a similar thing. What's happening though is that it's, it's getting harder and harder to understand these new platforms, right? Technology, technology because of all that, that uh, what we experience and, and the much greater number of the people and capital, it's all changing faster in a way than we can comprehend. Mm -hmm. And now that when it gets serious, um, when it gets substantial enough, there's more demand, now you have a regulatory, right, right. bottleneck. Um, you have, um, I think what happened last year was that we have the price action, uh, the, inter the retail interest in crypto created an attention the entire world experienced like nothing I've ever seen before. I've never seen yeah. the, yeah, so much group attention in something so new. I've never seen funding and parallel processing around the world of any technology ever. I've never seen that. So, I, so the question, I guess, is how long will it take before we get through this regulatory right. bottleneck? And right now, the markets are basically controlled by the, the, the changes of liquidity. The bull market, you know, last year was about liquidity going in, and now we're talking about liquidity going out. Mm -hmm. It doesn't actually change the where we're going to end up, you know, three or five years from now. Right. So, yeah, no, I mean, I, it's interesting from my seat. Um, you are starting to see a little more liquidity start to trickle back into this market. Um, so it'll be kind of interesting. But you brought up regulation. It was something I wanted to get to perhaps later. But since you brought it up, you know, to me, I look at this and one of the constraints, one of the limiters to this technology and to crypto adoption is this fragmented regulatory uh, environment that we have globally. Go to Asia, um, lots of adoption. Japan probably on the leading edge of the regulatory front. Um, does, that, does that limit this technology or is it just something, it's just part of the growing pains of crypto? I think it's growing pains. I also think this is a, a competitive regulatory situation. Okay. Meaning, um, meaning if you allow it, if you allow it and you believe you can, you know, police it, I guess you'd say, <laughs> You're also enabling human capital to come to your country or stay in your country. That's why I think it's competitive. Mm. It is not okay. It is not okay for everyone to. It's not going to happen that no one wants to allow it. It's a competitive situation. I mean, the you know, I, seven years ago, in trying to understand what when commodities I thought had busted were busting, I thought what's the differentiator going forward, and I came to the conclusion structurally that it's human capital. It's basically high value added human capital uh, that is gonna be enabled by how, how technology, the cost of technology changing. That mm -hmm. San Francisco was uh, up into the right, um, you know, real estate market. That it was, uh, that, that the West Coast was the most extraordinary place in the world, although the farthest away from everywhere else you could choose in the Northern Hemisphere. But the point is, this is only gonna be more the case. So I think the recognition that you want to attract human capital, not just capital, because you have to have the human capital, I think this is a competitive regulatory situation. So they're all learning at the same time and they're learning from each other. When we get through, you know, you're gonna have some fast followers when you get some bigger ones right. to, to, to enable it. It's just, you know, it can be despairing if you're watching any security go down in price because it looks like the market's saying this will never happen. Right. Well, those are the best opportunities, right? Yeah. When nobody else thinks it's gonna happen. Um, I also think building companies in bear markets uh, is, is far superior to bull markets. Everybody's totally rational and willing <laughs> in, to in join markets. with each other to uh, try yes. to do something uh, We were all geniuses at 20,000 Bitcoin. Yeah. So, um, so I'm curious then. So we've seen cryptocurrency. This is the thing that stuns me about this. We have now, what are we, we're almost eight years into this. Um, we have seen $200 billion roughly of market cap grow up and, and emerge with out a CEO, without massive data centers that are owned by companies, um, without a government-sponsored entity, anything. It's really been organic. So I'm curious, what does crypto and the success here tell us about the world today? Is there something we can gather from that and, and maybe look and say, all right, if it's doing this today, here's what it's going to look like in a couple more years? Well, it just shows that commerce in this 
form is, has emerged and is possible. Millennials, you know, their attitudes show you that this is very, very likely longer term. Um, I mean, in, in my view, what, you know, new technology basically releases information that wasn't, you know, you weren't able to release before or you know, find it, release information. So we're in a structurally, you know, logarithmically increasing world of new information, releasing information. The sequencing of the genome you know, obviously does that. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, what, what's required to uh, you know, have an autonomous driving car? You need to comprehend, you know, organize and release that information to these machines. This is just a version of that, and yet it's all in the service of commerce, really, between people, right? Between people, between organizations. So it makes sense that Bitcoin, you know, and it's, you know, it's 10 years now, almost 10 right. years. So it makes sense that this is uh, somewhat of a template. And we're, what, what's happening is that you have all these separate funded, you know, different tokens or projects, and a few will emerge as being incredibly valuable. And the market will learn from those that have become value and have value utility will start copying. And, and, and what you're just seeing, it's like, uh, you know, many different organisms, you know, learning from each other in a really accelerated way. <laughs> It's an interesting way to look at it. Far like more that. failures will happen, but but the you know, it's going to be dominated by the, the successes, and those successes are just alter better versions of doing something, you know, a traditional way. It, it requires a new platform, and then, but the market is always seeking lower costs, you know, easy, easier use, more liquidity. It's it's just going to happen at a faster, much faster pace in this era than it did before. Faster pace because it's software? Is that part well, of it? Partly, or? but you know, I, I think of like the buildup of technology as, um, you know, it's something like all these applications are plugging into everything that already exists. Mm -hmm. And it just, it, it takes less and less money to, to create an application that has value, right? right. And that, that okay. can affect more of the world. Yep. Um, the, 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 it's again, though, it's happening in so many different places so rapidly, it's really difficult to, digest it all. It's extraordinary. It really is extraordinary, the growth But it will only be more like that in the future. In the future. It's, it's just, this is so, the condition right, so, we're in. Right, so this is the world that we're in. We're in a disruptive world. Is there, let, let me get to, what is, let's look at the catalyst. I wanted, and I wanna talk a little bit about emerging market currency, strength of the US dollar. To me, those seems like, seem like natural catalysts uh, for adoption, at least on the currency front of it. Is that something that you look at? So, yeah, I, it's, what's good about Bitcoin is that it's the volatility is coming out of it. One of the you know, reasons people have previously said they don't like Bitcoin is the volatility. And, right. it, and I can agree with It's agree the with new that. stable coin. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Well, so now, it's, now you have liquidity, uh, you have volatility coming out. It looks like it's finding a bottom. It's much closer now than it was before. Mm -hmm. So there's that positive. But what I think is happening in the world as the dollar rises as the dollar rises, um, because the Fed is raising rates, among other things, what's happening is emerging markets are falling. And emerging markets t tend to act the opposite of what the dollar does. Last year, the dollar fell almost all year. EM went up, and EM topped January 25th or 26th, along with the, the currencies. Right now, you have the opposite. And I can tell you, if the dollar keeps rising, which I think it's going to do for at least for a few more months, EM and all those sovereign risks that, are, that, are, that go with the currency, the equities, the assets, many of which borrowed huge amounts of dollars, are going to keep going lower. And I think it's a relative trade, right? When you thought things were stable, actually fall apart, Bitcoin actually looks increasingly good, right? <laughs> right. And it's, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an accident, or, or, or I don't know if it's causal, but Bitcoin was created you know, really right at the, the depth of the financial crisis. Yep. It can be thought of as the opposite. So... I actually think I like this setup for Bitcoin. I like I like it because the risk reward relative to the evident low value wreckage of EM mm -hmm. and the limited, I think, upside for commodities, I, I think Bitcoin is winning. And so you'll know that more people are buying by price and liquidity. And then and then I think culturally people will start getting more favorable to it. But when the things that you thought were stable go down, you know, then I think you look for other things that you think think are you know, maybe not as risky as you thought, you right. know, like Bitcoin. Right. So this, so this can be somewhat of a digital gold without necessarily, I mean, gold itself has a, has a negative correlation to the dollar over time, um, except in periods of high inflation. So this can be the kind of a digital gold and a substitute for that. Um, 
So it's, you know, if we have multiple currency crises, that will likely be a catalyst to bring people into this asset class. I, I think so. I don't think it's an accident that uh, Bitcoin peaked uh, four to six weeks ahead of the EM peak. Mm -hmm. uh, EM's very sensitive to change the liquidity, change the dollar. We have a tightening, we have a tightening regime going on. It was a question of when would it show up in other securities. So the you know, NASDAQ, et cetera, which is you know, essentially future technology, has been rising. Now it's only starting to fall. But it just m much more sensitive to change liquidity is, is Bitcoin and crypto. You know, EM has now been falling since January. Um, other things, are small caps are starting to fall. Mm -hmm. I mean, many things should fall. And eventually we will encounter what we think is recession sometime next year, that, that, unless the okay. dollar is made is, is for whatever reason really falls right and then things will will feel better so that actually is a lot of people ask me this we don't have a lot of time but i want to get to this in a recession does bitcoin do well well if it's a recession then then uh, financial environment because the central banking should be a lot easier gold itself should do well i would say bitcoin probably does well okay but what i we have to what i think about is how young this technology is all these applicants very very young and so sometimes I like to say, you know, it's easy to make fun of seven-year-olds for what they can't do, right? Or 10-year-olds, yeah. right? But really you're trying to think about what that seven or 10-year-old is going to be able to accomplish or 15-year-old or 18-year-old, you know, when, they're, when, right. They're, right, when they're, they're developed and producing whatever they're going to produce. So it's, it's easy for other people to say, oh, this is ridiculous and the price is going down, whatever. But it's so young. It just takes time to develop these applications and for the market to comprehend them and to find utility. I think if you think that the cost, the, the, the costs are always falling, right? Mm -hmm. The market is looking for lower cost solutions that it can endorse, you know, and adopt. We're just, we're just, you know, a few years. I just don't know. Right. Six months, three years in the, in the you know, for, in terms of your life, it doesn't really matter whether it's a year or three years. Right. From, if you look at your account every day, it matters greatly. <laughs> yes. But the point is, I'm really confident this is going to end up being the foundation of certain kinds of commerce. Okay. And certain kinds of commerce is inclusive of, you know, huge numbers of people and therefore has tremendous value. So we'll, we'll be buying our coffee at Starbucks with it. We'll be, it'll be within the supply chain. It'll start to infiltrate global economy and commerce. If it saves you a percent, right, or whatever. Then people I mean, will do it. Yeah, I mean, then, right, we'll figure out a different way of doing it. And probably there are going to be all other kinds of benefits for doing it. And, but it just seems to build the, you know, the platforms, the technologies, the, the companies, the, the agreement, you know, the, the loose and then formal agreement of trading with each other, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, an examination. This is an examination right now of, uh, of what's, tr what's real, what's not. This is a bear market, but it's a liquidity bear market. Oh, interesting. Um, well, we're... we're we're out of time. I could go on uh, for hours about this. One last question just for the crowd here. Um, we don't know what it's going to look like five or ten years from now. I remind myself every day that MySpace existed before Facebook. Tech disrupts itself. Is Bitcoin MySpace? And if so, who's Facebook? Well, uh, I mean, five years from now, you'll be driven around by a machine right? Yep. You'll be, um, you'll understand because of the ge genome, right? You're going to understand what maladies and benefits are yours because of, you know, not lowest common denominator, but exactly because of who you are. And we will have sorted out what has value, commercial value, and what does not. And so I think the, the, the evidence, it's highly likely that Bitcoin has a, has a, has a big role here. Mm -hmm. But you can't say absolutely either. Right. I guess I'd say I'm more confident in Bitcoin than I am in Facebook, okay. actually. But I can't say absolutely that Bitcoin yep. is, uh, is uh, not going to be replaced by something with better technology. I got to ask this last question. You're more confident that Bitcoin will be around in five years versus fa Facebook? Is that it's what you're saying? That. It's not that. It's just that I don't, I don't feel very excited about. I, I, I think there is a, a, an evolving understanding of what it means to release your information and what okay. kind of, uh, you so, know, 
Commerce more excited gonna... about Bitcoin as an investment for the next five years than Facebook as an investment. Yes, in fact, you... in fact, I think the market already understands the biggest internet company, consumer internet companies have a lot of power. In fact, it's, right. it's very concerned about that power. Bitcoin is kind of the opposite. You know, it's, it's gaining understanding, gaining commercial users, and the utility of it, really all it has to do is be, you know, a few percent better than anything else to have, and everyone knows about it now. Right. In, right. The entire world can use it. So, but you can't absolutely say that Bitcoin is going to be the Bitcoin. Right. Right. And, and that's what you said about MySpace. Yep. Well, I know someone who was involved with, uh, with uh, Friendster uh, and said literally the, the difference of Friendster being Facebook or not was, was where the state of technology was. And then uh, one particular decision they made about how, uh, how many uh, degrees of separation they allowed their users to get to. It was that close, really? right, between them winning or something else. Bitcoin's technology is probably going to be kept being improved, right? And everybody yeah. already is there. So I would, I would, I don't know, I would be long Bitcoin here. Yeah. Yeah, and short Facebook in that regard. I like that. I like that trade. Well, on that, I think that's a perfect place to end it. Thank you very much, John. Really appreciated it.